Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Internet. Uh, my name's Craig. I am completely aware that none of you have a clue who I am. Uh, even if you've heard of my media company before, and I guarantee you haven't, uh, I'm usually, you know, the one behind the camera, not the one in front talking to everybody and exposing myself. Such as that is. Uh, so you may be wondering, well, what are you doing, you know? Well, I'm launching a YouTube channel. I'm going to be putting a lot of my work from the past 10 years online and putting things on that as I develop in the future as well. Uh, but I don't have any of my equipment yet. I don't have any of my professional little video packages and lower thirds and all those wonderful things to do wonderful HD and... You know what, none of, none of you care about that. Anyway, uh, the reason I'm posting this before I have any of my idiosyncrasy professional equipment, uh, an interesting topic came up the other day. A, uh, a friend of mine posted a, uh, a link to a video from YouTube on Facebook uh, where an atheist or a... I was actually unclear on what his beliefs were, but uh, the main thrust of things was atheism. And he uh, posed a lot of questions about what would happen if he, as an atheist, died and then found himself face to face with the Christian God. What would that, how would he react to that? Uh, you know, he, he he posts a lot of videos about topics that uh, bother him and, and uh, well, not bother him, but topics that he finds interesting. He, he likes philosophy and uh, critical thinking uh, over on his channel on YouTube, which he calls uh, Theoretical Bullshit. Uh, and so his, his answers, his questions were very interesting, he posed a lot of good points. Uh, you know, he's a very eloquent speaker, very uh, well articulated and then obviously very intelligent, thought provoking. Uh, the unfortunate thing that happened was that my friend who posted the video, or posted the link to the video, ended up having to take the discussion about the video down because people as they are wont to do on the internet, lived up to their reputation, and, pardon me as I fix my microphone, uh, lived up to their reputation, and proceeded to attack him for even posting the link to such a thing. So as a result, the entire discussion that was there disappeared into the digital ether, uh, including a response I had posted that I felt... Uh, you know, I would like to have back in some form, so I thought, what better way than to test video equipment and uh, my willingness to be public than to publish it here. I appreciate the debate. I appreciate the, the uh, openness of wanting to discuss the subject, and it's actually something I, I hope to do on my uh, podcast network I'm starting pretty soon, uh, sometime down the future, to, to have some open and honest debates about uh, not only uh, the existence of God, but uh, some of the other topics that people don't usually discuss with Christians, because Christians, uh, rightfully so, uh, have a reputation for being narrow-minded and judgmental and all of those things. So the good, meaty, well-thought-out debates on the subject where both sides can respect each other's point of view and give each other the opportunity to talk and express themselves in a well-versed manner don't ever happen. Uh, again, the existence of God, uh, heaven and hell, uh, was Jesus God or just a man or did he even exist at all, uh, homosexuality, pornography, uh, extramarital sex, uh, you, you name it, nothing will be off limits as far as topics so i thought well let's let's just do this you know i'll, I'll instead of retyping my entire script uh as i 
convince my dog to go elsewhere. <laughs> Instead of retyping my entire response, I would just... I'm just going to do this as a video and see what happens. Who knows how long it'll actually stay posted. <laughs> but, uh... So, this is my response to Mr. Clifton's uh, questions. I don't cover every topic that he did. He covered a lot. He posed a lot of points, some of which I have no direct response to. Uh, you know, he, he raised a lot of good points, and, and I'm... You know, I'm a Christian. First, let's get that out of the way. I am what the media currently calls an evangelical slash born-again Christian. Uh, I'm a Protestant, so I'm a non-Catholic Christian. I believe that I can speak to God directly by virtue of knowing his son, not having to go through a priest, and so on and so on. Uh, that is the point of view I'm coming from. That's the point of view that will be presented uh, on my side in the debates that I do. Uh, so take that as you will. Uh, I, I take, I'm, I'm going to try to basically just hit the points that Scott said that I felt I had something worthy to respond to. Uh, whether that was a direct rebuttal of something he stated or whether it was answering a question he asked. I did like the fact that he asked a lot of questions instead of just saying X, Y, and Z. He actually had questions to ask and so I'm gonna answer them as best as I can not being a theologian and just being an average Joe Schmo Christian which uh, you know I think sometimes people need to hear that point of view. Um, I am not as eloquent as he is Probably not even as intelligent, not as good a debater or speaker, uh, but I'm going to do my best and just be honest with you, and, and I really think that's all anyone can ask of me. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is, because he addressed this multiple times, just to get this out of the way, with the, the, the milk, God, and of course I'm talking about the Judeo-Christian God, does understand you, and he is proud of you because that topic got brought up several times. So that's the milk. Now getting to the meat. Uh, point one, perception of the observable world does not provide enough evidence for you to make your decision. Because as humans, our limited minds cannot conceive or perceive everything that exists. Uh, what I mean by that is we are not privy to the dealings of the spiritual world that goes on around us. This also answers another question he posed, which is why and how could he possibly have missed something by trying to arrive at a decision about his belief in God based solely on his human ability to reason? It's just not enough. Point two. He talks about seeing holes, or finding holes, I should say, during his examination of the subject of the existence of God. I would question whether those holes are actually holes or whether they are just more evidence of us as humans having the inability to understand a being like God. Uh, you know, do you really want to have a God that you can completely understand? Is he even a God at that point anymore? If we can completely and totally wrap our mind around him, He's not a god anymore. He's an entity or a being or some other science fiction fantasy thing. Uh, that's not the kind of god I want. I, I, I need a god that's mysterious. I need a god that is beyond me, completely beyond me. Uh, but what I find interesting is that science, capital S, <laughs> seems to feel quite comfortable accepting that things exist when there's no proof. Uh, you know, treating it as true even though it's just theory. And they, they will do that simply because they need that to be true to make their own conclusions that they otherwise have feasible and work within the system of our universe as we understand it. And you may say, okay, so what's wrong with that? Well, the problem comes back again to 
our understanding and perception is gravely limited and woefully inadequate. Point three. Uh, as Scott says, I agree, fearing punishment and or seeking reward are not good reasons for belief in the Christian God or belief in any God. Uh, belief is about accepting something that's larger than yourself, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, acceptance of, uh, in the case of the Christian God, a love that is beyond you. Uh, as humans, we accept the need to love people back because they love us. And it's really no more complex than that with our Creator. He loved us first, so we are to love Him back. That's a basic human thing, and it should be easy for most people to understand. Now, granted, this whole debate is over, is there a Creator in the first place? I will grant you that. Uh, okay. Point four. <laughs> Reiterating from the beginning, God is proud of you. God is not offended by you. You are his creation. He knit you together, as scripture tells us, in your mother's womb. And he designed every last detail, and that's physical and personality and everything else. His offense, therefore, is not to you because he made you. Why would he be offended by something he made? His offense is to the sin you were born into the imperfection. God is so perfect and so holy that he cannot stand to be in the presence of an atrocity like sin. I mean, sin by definition is separation from God. It is unholy, it is vile, it is dirty. He cannot stand to be in the presence of it just by his nature of being holy and pure. It's the same way that a single infectious microbe can ruin an entire clean room. It just takes one microscopic bit and the whole thing's shot. God cannot be around sin. Period. Point five. My script wasn't ready, I'm sorry. <laughs> um... Okay. This may get me in trouble with even some of my fellow believers. My thoughts on hell, since Scott brought that up as well. If God is omnipresent, then he's everywhere. That's the definition. If hell is separation from God, that is, God is with you even now whether you acknowledge him or not. He is giving you life. His mere presence is an impact on your existence. So, if hell is separation from him, who provides all of those things, and is omnipresent, then that means that he allows a place within himself, since he's everywhere, that he cannot bear to look at. Uh, he can't bear to influence it. He can't bear to interact with it. I personally can't comprehend the pain that that must cause him. But we know that that must be because God is, again, so holy, so good, and so pure he can't be defiled by the presence of sin. So, to say he's discompassionate by having a hell, by having a place he sends people, isn't fair. And finally, vanity. This is a difficult concept to tackle. Is God vain for not being able to be defiled by sin? Or is it just that he can't coexist with it the same way two things in nature can sometimes not coexist by the mere fact of their existence. 
Does that make him vain or make us not understand him? Uh, I find it, considering the examples in nature, completely acceptable that a being can be so pure and so good and so untainted that the mere presence of sin within him would be a physical or I guess a metaphysical impossibility. 